Welcome to the Stranded Technologies Podcast. I'm your host and founder of Infinita Fund, Nicholas Anzinger. In this show, we talk about how to accelerate the future. Our thesis is that many life improving technologies are held back by institutional barriers. How can we unblock vast opportunities while mitigating against the risks? What ethical principles, rules, and regulations can guide us on that path? We will discuss these questions with entrepreneurs, policymakers, and industry experts. If you enjoy the show, please give us five stars and visit us at infinitafund.com to join the community. Today is another special episode. I want to synthesize some insights myself, insights that I had from the past 24 conversations on this podcast and my research over the past eight months. It's the intersection of regulation and its influence on innovation and growth has become something that I sometimes wake up at night thinking about and I don't have a unifying theory together, but I believe that there is a big gap that we're filling with this podcast and by having these conversations. And I think the gap was mostly about, on the one hand, an academic literature and economics and law, the efficiency of law. And on the other hand, the practice. There's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands business practitioners who are grappling with regulation on a daily basis. And I don't think these two ecosystems are talking to each other. And I think we're learning tons by talking to practitioners and using the insights from the literature to think about the problems we're facing and come up with better solutions. This is in a way why I do the podcast. I want to help innovators, meaning entrepreneurs and change makers, better understand the pervasive influence of regulation on innovation and growth and find solutions together. Let me iterate one more time why this is so important in my view. So I'm basically summarizing episode 10 again, where I already spoke about economic growth. So John Maynard Keynes had a famous essay titled The Economic Possibilities of Our Grandchildren. It's from 1930 or something, I believe. He made one important observation about the pre-modern era where we didn't have a lot of growth or development. He said, this slow rate of progress or lack of progress was due to two reasons. To the remarkable absence of important technical improvements and to the failure of capital to accumulate. So these are the two factors that enabled growth, capital accumulation and technical improvements. With capitalism and markets, so Keynes, we have found a way to unlock growth in these areas. And this is a major advance in the history of humanity. We got to about 2% annual growth during peacetime. And Keynes calculated, that with 2% growth per year, the economic pie increases by 7.5x in 100 years. And these 7.5x is more stuff that we have. It's less poverty. It's increasing options for transportations and lower costs of all sorts of things and potentially even more free time. Now, if you expand on that, if you assume we could have 2.5% growth, we would 12x what we have right now in 100 years. If it's 3%, you would get 20x. If it's 5% even, you would get 130 times what we have now. So if we have 2% now, is 5% impossible? What if we're able to find the levers that unlock greater capital accumulation and technical improvements? and get to that 100x difference in the wealth of humanity. And I believe here's where regulation comes in. Regulation or rulemaking directly impacts capital accumulation and technical improvements. We've seen many examples in this podcast that make the direct link how regulation prevents technical improvements. Of course, regulation is not only a bad thing. I've always said there are good regulations and bad regulations, and good regulations are probably a reason why we have 2% economic growth. But I think it's really the bad regulations that are holding us back now. 
And it seems to me the process of making rules is defunct. I encourage you to listen to Tom W. Bell and episode seven of this podcast to get the full picture and discussing how law is in a way the code of society. Rules are if-then statements and software and code are if-then statements. So if we can get this code right, we could unlock this 100x wealth of humanity. Since you're still listening, I assume that you're open-minded about regulation and rulemaking and thinking about it can be something tremendously exciting. And even if you think it's boring, it's important to understand how it affects you. By you, I assume you're an innovator. You're interested in technological progress. And I know many of you are founders and entrepreneurs and you want to improve things. This is for you. To summarize why it is important to talk about regulation besides the 100x, unlocking 100x growth, Ambitious founders need to navigate regulations. So see the episodes, for example, with Carolyn Cochran from Oklo about nuclear power, Zina Zarif about cancer clinical trials, Sean Pauly from Sasha on international finance, or Santiago Pinzon on autonomous drone delivery. Second, if you're in crypto, this question must constantly pop up. I encourage you to watch the debate between Eric Voorhees and Sam Bankman-Fried, where two worldviews clash. Or I would say one inconsistent worldview is clashing with a very consistent and principled worldview. If you don't have a consistent and principled worldview, you may end up like SBF. Third, the biggest and most important industries in the world are heavily regulated energy and power, real estate, finance, education, healthcare. I think these five together make up more than 50, maybe even 70% of world GDP. If you're a founder and want to make an impact, you need to be able to navigate complex regulations. Fourth, the age of the nation state seems to be in turmoil. In the best case, and that's the case that I work towards, we see a more open and decentralized world. In the worst case, we see a more custodial and gated world. To create a better future, I believe we need to understand rulemaking and how it works and how to get it right. With that said, I now talk about my 10 thesis about regulations. Number one, there are no adults in the room. Our knowledge of the multi-layered effects of government regulation is on par with medieval doctors. This point is so important to me, I want to read a longer quote from an essay by my favorite philosopher, Michael Humer, that's called In Praise of Passivity. In 1799, America's first president, George Washington, fell ill with what is now thought to have been an infection of the epiglottis in his throat, a rare but serious condition that can lead to blockage of the airway and eventual suffocation. His good friend and personal physician attended him, along with two consulting physicians. Medicines and poultices were tried, along with five episodes of bloodletting that together removed over half of Washington's blood. As one contemporary account explained, the proper remedies were administered, but without producing their healing effects. The former president died shortly thereafter. Needless to say, his treatment either had no effect or actually hastened the end. Washington's doctors were respected experts and they applied standard medical procedures. Why were they unable to help him? Put simply, they could not help because they had no idea what they were doing. The human body is an extremely complex mechanism. To repair it generally requires a detailed and precise understanding of that mechanism and of the nature of the disorder afflicting it, knowledge that no one at the time possessed. Without such understanding, almost any significant intervention in the body will be harmful. Voters, activists, and political leaders of the present day are in the position of medieval doctors. They hold simple pre-scientific theories about the workings of society and the causes of social problems from which they derive a variety of remedies, 
almost all of which prove either ineffectual or harmful. Society is a complex mechanism whose repair, if possible at all, would require a precise and detailed understanding of a kind that no one today possesses. Unsatisfying as it may seem, the wisest course for political agents is often to simply stop trying to solve society's problems. This is not an abstract point. If you haven't seen it yet, again, I highly encourage you to watch the debate between Sam Bankman-Fried and Eric Voorhees, which was shortly before the FTX collapse. They were debating the nuances of the regulation that SBF proposed. SBF frequently uttered in the debate, I don't know what's the right solution. This seems to have been a moment of honesty. However, Voorhees countered, and I don't quote exactly, you're one of the smartest people in crypto, and you don't know? How are regulators and the public supposed to know what's the right thing to do? This moment was golden to me. SBF paused for almost one minute because he just lacked the words to respond. I think he knew Eric was correct. If you don't know what's the right decision to solve a very complex problem, better don't propose a blunt solution that affects hundreds of millions of people. I'm even tempted to defend SBF compared to the hypocrisy on parts of politicians and regulators. At least SBF admitted in this instance that he didn't know. The pretension of knowledge on the side of the rule makers is staggering. Let's not pretend we know. Thesis number two. The public debate equates regulation with government regulation. Don't fall for this obfuscation. Regulations can be morals or customs. They can be created, created by markets. Code has a regulating function, software code. Also, the way we do government regulation right now or today is just one way, the statutory law way. A common law is a more decentralized way of making laws. All sorts of markets and communities, offline and online, work without one-size-fits-all federal or national government regulation and have worked for hundreds of years. Do we need some government regulation? That's what I always get asked. But this question doesn't matter right now or for this thesis. The key point is just that it isn't the only way to make rules. Thesis number three, pro-authority bias influences a common association. We associate regulation with stability. We frequently hear that. If crypto was more regulated, more people would be interested or I would be interested. This is pro-authority bias at play because as we've heard before, there are already rules. There are already rules against fraud. There are already markets. Once you commit fraud, you're done in the market. Nobody wants to buy your products anymore. Does anyone want to get on FTX or buy from Bankman Fried now after that collapse? You don't need regulation to prevent people from getting on that or a similar platform again. And honest people would, in the future, say, what are these exchanges doing? What are they doing with our money? What are the insurances? But again, to call for one solution, government regulation is pro-authority bias at play. And it's not entirely irrational. I think people are afraid of the government fining you or putting you in prison because that's what they do quite regularly. So you want a statement from them. Hey, are you okay with this? That's what it is. It's unclear how crypto is taxed, for example. In these moments, I think people are unconsciously aware if they or the government approves it, I'm safe from coercion. This is a deep and dangerous human flaw. Stanley Milgram famously did experiments that revealed this pro-authority bias. So you had experimenters in lab coats telling people to seriously harm other people. That's because that's what is needed for the experiment. It's dangerous. I think political leaders and dictators frequently take advantage of that flaw. However, it's true that good rules can ensure stability, but it's not true that good rules come only from government. See the first point. We have to look at what the rules are, not who made them. Same as we look at software code for what it does, not for who made it. Thesis number four. 
we accept regulation against people we don't like. Drug users, prostitutes, gambler, snake oil salesmen, rubber barons, immigrants, the whole country of Iran. Also, the whole history of housing and zoning regulations is a history of exclusion. It's a regulation to keep people out that we don't want in our neighborhoods. So this is something to be very aware of because it's so pernicious. Any regulation, or I should say government regulation, is typically covered by the press portraying a group of people as bad. Right now, the phrase is tech bros. This is appalling and dehumanizing. It's like putting a tag on a group of people to be hunted, or at least reduce empathy for their pleas and arguments. I see that on LinkedIn all the time among really smart and professional people. As a public official, you can't defend unpopular groups. Because if you say, oh, I think we're mistreating drug users, putting them in prison for a victimless crime, you'll be asked, oh, so you're on the side of drug users. Maybe you're a heroin addict yourself. This is dangerous, and we need to start criticizing that humanization before it's too late because that's the pretext before you get regulation that frankly violate the rights of people. Thesis number five. Government regulation follows as a reaction to high-profile public events. The Lidomite gave us the, many of the powers of the FDA. 9-11 gave us the Patriot Act and airline safety regulations or airport regulations. The financial crisis gave us Dodd-Frank and a decline in founding new banks. Now we have FTX going on. If you're cynical, you could say public officials never let a good crisis go to waste. But it's people who want it. It's us. We demand for that reaction. It's called action bias. Whenever the house is burning, we look for someone to, to call the shots. Again, we're like the medieval doctor overreacting to the disease of a patient. The cures we give are worse than the disease. Thesis number six. We regulate seen consequences and disregard unseen consequences. There was an interesting example from episode 24 about autonomous drones. So... The FRA, the airline safety regulator in the United States, hasn't been allowing drones for tens of years. And they tested it in Rwanda, and it reduced maternal mortality. One is a scene consequence. There's something happening, the drone hurts someone. And regulators go against that. The debate is all about these scene consequences. The unseen consequences, how many lives it could save, they're not part of the debate. There's an invisible graveyard, or another way to phrase it, a type 2 error kill, right? So type 1 error, you allow for a drug or for a procedure, but it's bad and it kills people or hurts people. And type 2 error, you don't allow it, but it's good and would have saved people's lives. We see type 1 errors clearly. We don't see type 2 errors. Which is why regulators that are tasked are typically erring on the side of preventing type 1 errors, but not type 2 errors. Nobody's responsible, or we can't even clearly see or measure the type 2 errors that we're making. But we're making them all the time. In the history of this podcast, we've seen countless examples. For example, episode 4 or 8, where we talked about the FDA and how it failed to allow that are diabetes drugs for 30 years, or the role it played in preventing people from getting life-saving medications during the HIV epidemic in the 1980s. Thesis number seven. Even in the absence of binding obligations, public officials have a strong herd mentality. Now, this is very important because we're sometimes tempted to see, oh, we just need more competition between jurisdictions. I say that very often. Startup cities, more federalism, more localism, more, more decentralization. But something that I keep thinking about a lot, and I don't know a solution yet, to be quite frank, is during COVID, there was no country besides Sweden, and might not have even been the best idea, to charter a different course when it comes to 
how they dealt with, uh, with the pandemic. We've also seen in the episode about drones that airline safety regulations internationally are not binding. It's just that countries adopt them anyway because they don't they want to adopt like the best practices. I think one big reason for that is that you don't have any upside for allowing something positive and from avoiding type two errors. I don't know yet how, but somehow we need to be able to create incentives for making better and efficient rules. Thesis number eight. Most regulations fail because they don't address the safety paradox. The safety paradox is something that we heard very often in the episode about drones again or about nuclear power. The regulator is asking for safety features, and that's quite important. Of course, everyone wants safety. But there was an interesting quote from one episode. Our customers aren't buying a drone, they're buying a service. So even with infinite money, it would be very hard to build our service in a lab. You have to learn by doing. You can't develop algorithms in a lab and expect them to work in the real world. Or Oklo and nuclear power. Carolyn said the same thing. To show that something or new technology is safe, we need to have experimental data. But we can't do experiments <laughs> because we're not allowed to service or operate and test it in the real world. As a result, you lock in existing technology and the existing technology might have a reasonable amount of safety, but it could not be enough. Not enough people have access to it and need to look at different configurations that make it cheaper, that make it more efficient. And these need to also be tested for safety. So you're freezing in status quo technology. In the case of nuclear, we've heard how backwards and stagnant the nuclear industry has been as a result from a massive, massive amount of regulation. This is not making us safer. It's making us less safe because we have less cheap and clean energy at scale. And this leads to all sorts of other problems down the road. This is number nine. The main problem with regulation is the decision-making mode, how we make decisions. And again, I don't have a solution yet there but I found the book by Balaji Srinivasan, The Network State, very enlightening. I think it's just a starting point at proposing different ways of making decisions, initially in online communities. But yet this one quote that I think sums up the problem with the process of how we make decisions on rules and regulations. And I quote, Our entire antiquated process of adversarially writing high stakes laws on paper at the last minute, deploying them in production to hundreds of millions of people without any testing, and then getting them interpreted in unpredictable ways by regulators and solicitors will be seen as a bizarre relic of an older time. There's so much to unpack in that one quote, some points we already touched on. One is the adversarial point. Right? We make decisions by voting one party or one person in office. And all they need is like a 50 plus percent majority. These laws are very high stake. They affect everyone. And we can't, how do we make decision how big or small it is? If you're in a position of power, you want to make these high stakes laws because that's the only way to get anything done. They're done at the last minute. That goes to the point that I mentioned before that regulations are the reaction to high-profile PR disasters. We deploy them in production to hundreds of millions of people without any testing. This is a very important point. Again, when you compare it to how we do software, we release, we test it with users on a small scale. And there we see the flaws and mistakes. And then we go back and correct them and fix bugs. This is not working. Right now, that's not happening. This is also something that's very important that I didn't find yet the right words for. There is this equation of government regulation with stability. But actually, the opposite is the case. Actually, because of the lack of clarity, oh, is Bitcoin or is this crypto a security or utility or a commodity? These rules have been written in the 1930s, and they are just not very clear. They didn't know anything about digital assets back then. This makes it more unpredictable, not more predictable, <laughs> right? So if you're a crypto company, you know, these 
regulations are often written as we speak, again, in this adversarial process. Nothing about that is safe or stable. It's a recipe for instability. You constantly have to worry what's the right way. Thesis number 10. Bad regulations are very hard to get rid of. And this is one of the most depressing thesis, but there's going to be a segue into something more optimistic. Bad regulations are very hard to get rid of. I just want to mention this and again quote the Machiavelli effect that we've heard many times on this podcast because it's so important for entrepreneurs and founders to understand what they're up against if they go into some of these industries that are highly regulated. I quote, there is nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. Because the innovator has for enemies all those who have done well under the old conditions and lukewarm defenders in those who may do well under the new. This coolness arises partly from fear of the opponents who have the laws on their side and partly from the incredulity of men who do not readily believe in new things until they have had a long experience in them. Thus it happens that whatever those who are hostile have the opportunity to attack, they do like partisans, while the others defend lukewarmly in such a way that the prince is endangered along with them." End quote. Now here's the more optimistic upside take. And this is a segue into some, some solutions I've been thinking about. So. There's been two groups that criticized overregulation, economists and libertarians. Libertarians because of the limits of regulations on freedom to do business and contracts. Economists because they're the first to spot market inefficiency. But these are small groups that only in rare cases, if ever, move the needle. However, now is the time to make changes. And the big change that happened that makes now the perfect time how we can disrupt the market for rules is the blockchain. The blockchain has made change in the financial and legal worlds a real possibility. Before Bitcoin, economists and libertarians have debated for decades how to decentralize money and have criticized that the government has a monopoly on printing money. But all you could do is employ a few dozens of economists at university chairs and fill a couple of magazines. There was no bigger industry or no technology how to build alternative and better institutions that exists now with Bitcoin, with the blockchain, with decentralized finance. The blockchain transformed the arguments against government money from an academic back office debate into a trillion dollar industry. It's a seismic moment in history comparable to the horse revolution, the gunpowder and steel revolution that has the potential to fundamentally change the balance of power. I will now close with four more thoughts on potential solutions because right now, again, we are at the moment in history where we can realistically change things. Number one, we need a clearer language like government regulation, custodial regulation versus non-custodial, like in crypto, decentralized versus centralized, nimble versus blunt, or flexible versus inflexible, something like that. We need to be very careful with the language. Second, regulation is good when it creates independent oversight or transparency in an efficient way. So it's again goes to the blockchain. So we need to use it to build on-chain truth, to build transparency, to encode security and build better institutions that way. Number three, there is already regulatory competition and we accept it in many areas of life. We have to utilize it. I also think, and I was thinking to make that as an 11 thesis, but 11 doesn't sound as good as 10. I think custodial regulators don't worry about small experiments in other countries. I don't think there's an inherent human bias against experiments. If they're small, especially they're too costly to monitor. So you don't have enough time or resources to oversee everything that's happening. 
And especially if they're in other countries, there's just nothing for you to lose. So this provides a space for solutions. We have now living in a world where it's easier to work remotely, easier to travel. And at least if you're from some countries, unfortunately not others, easier to get access or work from other countries and utilize other jurisdictions. I hope that will increase. I hope we'll have more organizations will get used to work decentrally, remotely. We can do clinical trials decentrally. We can ship people to other locations to get medical tourism. We where we can create where we have autonomous zones, special economic zones, or waivers to conduct certain experiments. There's also a growing market for international business domiciles. I mentioned often the Catawba Digital Economic Zone, the Prospera, where I'm based, or also Polo wants to create a new business domicile. Smaller countries such as Estonia or Malta or Portugal are also trying to compete for talent. And number four, we need to exit. We need to go to where we can build the solutions, right? We shouldn't just move on and do something that's easier or something that is allowed. We shouldn't do things that could put us in prison. And of course, never things that are actually unethical, right? So the big and important thing we need to do is do it better, right? So FTX was and Sam Bankman Fried was a grand, great example of not doing it right. And SBF wasn't the one who was deep in the crypto or decentralized finance ethos. He was the one who was pro regulation and he was lobbying for regulation. And he was deeply unethical in the way he conducted business. So if you're on the side of myself, of Eric Warhees, and the true cypherpunk ethos, then, you know, we're not building the Wild West. We're not building unregulated spaces, less regulated, maybe. But we're using those to create better products, to create more safety. So we have to show, like any other startup, that we can do a 10x better. Because if it's not 10x better, we won't be able to make it mainstream. So I leave these 10 theses for you to comprehend and think about in the description of the episode. I will leave links to the Discord channel or you can reach out to me per email, nicholas at infinitafund.com. Really curious to hear what you think about these 10 theses and the four solutions. In the future of this podcast, I want to talk more about how businesses have managed to create broader legitimacy. So for example, Uber has faced, or Airbnb have faced problems like the ones we were talking about. They were in frequent and fierce battles with the regulators or the early internet in the 90s. And so these started with these battles and then eventually became or reached broader legitimacy. So if you know any guests that could talk about this early internet era or what Uber or Airbnb or businesses that face these regulatory challenges and eventually became big, please let me know or make the introduction because this is really important to think about when we, as we unleash this movement to create a new wave of technological progress and 100x humanity. Thank you for listening. <laughs>